Alrighty, so got three minutes to go. I'm just getting set up. I'm all set up. Just getting ready, ready, ready to jump in. We should go. Hello. Good to see you guys. So, uh, it's just about time. I'll start getting all jumped in here. So, what you see on your screen right now is uh, my little USB digital oscilloscope. And I've got a capture up from earlier when I was uh, fussing with a couple of different pieces. Uh, so we've got in green here. This is the uh, the actual signal coming from our piezo disc, and in yellow is the output from the amplification circuit. That's not what your printer sees. It's what the onboard at Mega chip sees. Um, I will do a quick tap on this little. I've got a, a 12 millimeter piezo hooked up to it right now. This is actually the the Rev 1.1.1. One of these that you guys are all going to be getting. And you can see that's what we're reaching that. Come on. There you can see our rise time coming from the piezo and then the drop from the uh, the amplification circuit. If we go over to our channel one, I wanna say. Yeah. See our fall time. Twelve mil or four milliseconds, so pretty fast. So you have to have to deal with a lot more than that on <clears throat> a lot more time on that than um, with like for instance the smart effector built by DC42 is doing analog reads so it's actually pulling a little bit more processing in there. <clears throat> anyway, just double checking, can you guys hear me okay? <clears throat> anyway, I'll get back into it. So uh, do you guys want me to go over like how um, piezos themselves work, the um, the ampli uh, amplifiers, or you just want me to show you exactly how this particular circuit works? That's what I wanted to have. 
Not quite. I can fix that. Oh, just a little more. How's that? Any better? Need a bit more, or? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to pull up the circuit that we're running, running off of right now, which is the V111. Okay. Let's here. So, uh, what you've got here is, I can't really see my mouse on this particular instance here. I'll just go by what the name of each part is. So, um, on the input, you've got an amplifier um, of 3xk, which means that we've got a something called a high impedance input. So, your piezo, uh, the piezo discs themselves can put out a voltage, but what they put out has not a lot of current behind it. It's a tiny little spike of voltage. So, it's fast, has, um, has some voltage behind it, but the, uh, has some voltage and speed, but it doesn't have a lot of oomph. So if I was to put that into another part of the circuit without having an amplifier on it first, it would just sort of get lost in all the noise. So we do an amplification first. Uh, you'll notice that there's a couple of diodes sitting on there. All, all that really does is it keeps the, um, the piezo from going above or below the maximum for the actual circuit itself. It's, uh, the, it's tied to 5 volts, so anything above 5 volt gets just drained into the 5 volt rail. Anything below ground just gets drained into ground. Um, and then we've got <clears throat> a 1 meg uh, pull down resistor between the plus input here and ground. Um, and what that does is it just makes sure that the piezo disc is starting at it's got starting at zero volts, so it can only go up from there. Now our first stage there is, again is like three. It's a three x out, three uh, x gain. So what goes in comes out at three times the amplitude of where it came in. Now in our second stage here, the VREF buffer. Now a lot of people ask me about what that actually does, and initially this is what I was using. Um, as a way to get the, um, the circuit to be more tunable and more sensitive. Um, and what it does is it brings the, the output of that, that gain stage up to what's called mid-rail. So you'll notice that there's two resistors uh, down at the bottom of that VREF buffer, R, um, R10 and R4. They're both the same resistance. And what that means, uh, no, actually, at UCN, that's, um, that's a, well, it's 3.3, um, Divided by 10, so it, it, it's about a pound a third. Um, I mean, it, it could be a little bit more or less than that, you're right, but um, mostly it's, it's 3x. Anyway, uh, so with the, um, the voltage follow, um, uh, the VREF buffer voltage follower, um, I've got two resistors that are attached, one's to, one's to 5 volt, one is to ground, and we have the input to that, um, to the V follower uh, tied in the middle of that, and that's called a voltage divider. So if you have uh, I can send you guys the calculations in there if you like, but since both of those resistors are the same value, it basically takes the midpoint, the, the middle voltage between the 5 volt and the ground, and sticks that in at the, uh, at the plus point there. And that, again, is getting tied in. Uh, it's being used basically as a, as a pull-up on the output for that amplification circuit. So, uh, because it's a 1 meg ohm resistor, it's a very, very slow rise time for that, or fall time, depending on which direction it's going. So it gives the, uh, the circuit the ability to filter out some of the, uh, um, the big up and down squiggles you'll see in a second on uh, when I switch back over to the, to the actual piezo itself. Um, and that's going into the non-inverting, or the inverting input, the negative input on our, la on our comparator. So basically what that means is that we have our piezo circuit uh, our, our piezo signal is coming in on a negative line, and that's going to be compared with the positive line, as you'll see on this, on this comparator. Once the negative line crosses the threshold of the positive line, then our Z trigger goes low. It just goes, gets dropped to ground. And that 
threshold is governed in this particular circuit by this voltage, I mean, the auto adjust ladder. And that's, again, another voltage divider. And it's just changing the value of that voltage division by pulling each successive resistor to ground in series, depending on whether I've got the, um, the input of that on the microcontroller set to an input or an output and set it to, uh, to be low. That was a really crude way of doing it, um, but it was really stable, which is why I went that direction. I wanted to avoid noise, and until I went and waved the, uh, an antenna around my office, I didn't realize exactly how much noise was just in the air, and it didn't really matter how much noise I was making, so I switched it over in the V2 to a different method, but I'll get into that in a second. So um, I'm going to go back over to the oscilloscope view for a second with that circuit in, in view. So you can see kind of what we're doing. I'm going to go and stick uh, a probe. The uh, the green one is going to stay on the piezo input, so uh, the PZ or the, the little plus on the very far left hand side of the amplifier. And this uh, spot here. And then here's our voltage follower. We'll see a little bit. Trigger up, so that's going to be the auto for a second. Let's see a little bit of that rise time, so that's what I need to do. Trigger on channel two, and that trigger is right here. Stuck that on the right spot. You're supposed to see a little bit of a rise in the yellow here, as long along with the green. See the the the, uh, the change in the uh, the amplification circuit there. All right, okay. let me try sticking that in a different spot then. Uh, ah, there it is. I was using the wrong probe pin. There we go. Okay, so here's a, an example of the, uh, this is the amplification stage, and it's doing its thing. You can see the, uh, the green is the actual, is what's coming in from the piezo disc, and the yellow is the amplification uh, coming out uh, of that particular part. So that's our 3x gain, I believe. So that's that's our first stage in action. You can see that uh, the green here. Oh, actually, that's sort of where they're supposed to be. So we've got our actual piezo input, and then the amplified out um, input on yellow here. And then that. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's what it was. I was going to show you the comparator on that. So the that that first line I just showed you a minute ago. Uh, with the, uh, the static line on it, that's actually our, our comparator voltage. So when the, the yellow line here would have crossed that line in the oscilloscope, uh, or in, the, in this case in the, uh, on the comparator, that's when our, our output trigger goes low. And as you can see from earlier, we had like a four, mill, four millisecond fall time. I think it, it can go even faster than that in some circumstances. This is this is using a, a 12 millimeter piezo disc, so it's actually a lot slower than something like the 27 millimeter. Oh, uh, let me go and poke that in. Gain up. Hopefully that's enough for you guys. Okay, so. Let's get back over to the other circuit. So that's that particular uh, circuit working. What I'm going to be switching over to is a method to, to change the, uh, the various different parameters on that circuit in dynamic 
in a dynamic way. So I've got the new, the new schematic coming up in just a second here. So we've got, this is the, ver the version 2, uh, where it's got, uh, the microcontroller has full control over the entire circuit. It can change the, the gain factor by editing the, or by, by changing the resistor ladder here at the bottom uh, under, under, under the gain stage. Uh, it's the same sort of principle, you're using a voltage divider uh, to adjust how much uh, gain that particular circuit has. Uh, and I'm just pulling each of those, those pins low depending on how much gain I want to get. And uh, it, with this particular one, I've got it set up so that I can have anywhere from 2 gain, uh, two x gain up to 10x gain. So the next stage on that, under the voltage follower, you'll see that we've now got uh, two capacitors, a little resistor, and a voltage follower PWM input from the microcontroller. And that is uh, basically just PWM input and a low-pass filter to smooth it out, and that will give us a stable voltage um, that can be easily controlled. Uh, same thing is going on in the comparator stage now, so we've got uh, the, the upper threshold on that is being set by PWM low-pass filter again, uh, and uh, the everything's sort of tied together the same way as the first circuit. Uh, the only difference being that the both upper and lower thresholds are controlled by the PWM, and the gain is also adjustable now. Let me go and pull that up alongside the oscilloscope, and I'm going to start putting probes on this board because I actually have a lot more breakout points on this one because it's just on the breadboard. By the way, I apologize; I can't show you a lot of this on the actual breadboard itself because the uh, the webcam I, I brought doesn't seem to work on this system. It works fine on, on uh, the Octopi, but whatever. So, it's hooked. You need to come off. You need to go on. Put my grounding leads on. The first thing I'm going to do is show you the, um, the PWM output for this thing. Set this to normal. Oh. oh, fun thing. If I if I go and connect this ground out in a couple of places, see that that is just the EMF that's flipped around my office. That's pretty bad in here. So um, let's see. Oh, that didn't clamp quite right. Here is our PWM signal and our other PWM signal that's coming out from the, uh, the Arduino volume. There we go. So you can see the duty cycles are a little bit uh, offset there, and we're getting uh, um, one of them is. Pretty uh, pretty low compared to the other one. That's because this, this is our, our um, voltage reference threshold for the uh, for the lower threshold, and number two is our our threshold for the upper threshold. So those are just the two starting points for our waveform, and or the, the starting and the ending point rather. And let's see, see on, on the output. I'm just going to take the uh, the green one off. I'm going to stick that on the on the filtered side of that circuit. So you can see it's nice and stable. Sit at 1.5 volts, roughly. Our RMS is actually sorry, 1.25 volts, which is a, I don't think it's what I, what I was sitting it to, but I can sort it out later. Um, then let's get the isoprobe output. That's on green. There we go, and let's get. Our amplified output here. Need to set this up as one volt. Wait. Yay! There's doodles of noise. I forgot about that thing. Yeah. One volt might be. There we go. Trigger here, normal on rising. There we go. Okay. 
car. Right away. So there's our amplification. Uh, didn't catch the beginning of that. Looks like. Try that again. There we go. Okay. And you can see a little bit better what's going on with that. I mean, it's a little higher, so it doesn't keep doing that. There we go. Okay, so our green is our amplified uh, output, I believe. No, that's our, sorry, the green is our is just the piece of straight out. And the yellow is the amplified output after it's, it's gone through the first piezo stage. I'm going to go and stick that probe onto the, uh, the comparator output. Where we will see the uh, rise time. We'll need to do a falling edge. I stuck it on the, uh, the PWM, PWM output, not on the trigger output. One second, I'll get that there. It is. There we are. Okay. I think. Here's a bit. I think. Okay, there we go. Normal. There we are. Okay. So. We've got basically an analog input signal getting translated into digital, where when it crosses the, uh, the threshold that we've set for PWM, the output signal goes low, and because it, it pops up a little bit here, it goes back up, back down through the, the slope there. So um, anyway, when that yellow signal gets pulled low, it's attached to an, uh, to an interrupt pin. And the interrupt pin on the uh, the AVR is tied to the um, the output that's connected to your 3D printer controller, which is also going to be it's pulled up and it'll be brought low on that interrupt. Same way that just about any other um, 3D printer uh, controller works. So it's a um, active low sensor when it's acting like this, which is good for safety. I used to have it on active high, but fix that. Um, but either way, the, uh, the V2 on this one should allow us to, to make profiles based on what kind of piezo disk you're using, what kind of printer you've got, what kind of uh, mechatronics you're using, or the kinematics you're using, how you've got your, your things set up. Uh, speaking of which, I got a couple of the, the mounts that I built um, here to showcase exactly how those work. Um, haven't gotten these actually installed in anything yet because I, I was silly and using the dryland uh, bearings when I shouldn't have been, and it kept on binding. I thought there was something wrong when there wasn't. Um, anyway, so we've got our our uh, our x-axis carrier, which has the bearings and it's got our little channels for the uh, for the, the belts and um, a mounting set of mounting holes for the the, uh, the piezo board. And we get our fulcrum. Now this is what you attach to your extruder, and that gets attached like so. You have a little fulcrum there. The screw goes through it with a little uh, nut on the other side. You have a piezo disc that would sit uh, in the middle under here, like so. And then when this, and then you have the nozzle touches the bed, this will move up in that way. And then poke the, uh, the piezo disc. Now uh, I realized that in, uh, introduces some instability into the extruder. However, I've developed it 
in such a way that it won't go further that way. So there's there's a limiting set of bolts at the top that that screw all the way through and attach on there. So it can't move further that way. And there's going to be very strong springs. Like we have the 7.5 millimeter springs that you see being used on extruders. And I'll just pop those in there. So, and it holds it very, very firmly right in there. So, and between having the two different spots to keep the, uh, the extruder plate uh, firm, but it's got enough wiggle that it'll be able to poke the, uh, the piezo disc on there. And uh, all you need is a little bit of flex, as, um, as I'll show you on the, on the Monoprice Delta Mini in a minute here. But <clears throat> if you don't have any flex at all, then it, it won't work. So you need to have just a little bit. Uh, the stiffer it is, the better. Uh, but uh, that's just for, uh, depends on how you, how you machine it or how you engineer it. And I'll be doing a lot of iterations with you guys, making sure that it works on your printers and whatnot. So um, I'm open to suggestions. I've got some good ideas occasionally, and um, I'm sure I could I could probably um, do things better in, in certain circumstances. Something I have noticed is that the the underbed um, method worked really well on this monoprice. So I think that's going to be the the preferred method for for most people. I think unless you want to get the uh, the FFC extruder uh, board. You know, which I got a few of those around here. I can show you later. Um, the Delta has its piezo discs just mounted straight underneath the bed, underneath each of these corners where it has the uh, these little buttons. Uh, So on the bottom of this thing, you'll see it's got these little tactile switch buttons, which are kind of used for, for like controllers or for your mouse, things like that. But they're not really good for doing bed leveling because there's just there's no consistency with the actuation, which is why these particular printers have such a concave sort of issue with their um, their bed leveling. So at any rate, um, what I've done is gone and pasted the piezo discs on the bottom of this thing uh, using some uh, thermal tape. So it's the kind you use for like pasting heat sinks on the, uh, on the CPUs and whatnot, so it shouldn't release with the heat, thankfully. And uh, the buttons that are currently there are, currently, are also what are poking those pieces of this. I need to fix that. It, again, the, the, the actuation is uncertain with those, so it's not giving me the kind of consistency I want. It's still coming in at about 0.12 millimeters um, of repeatability, which is much higher than I want. So uh, I'm going to just go and print some uh, some like cones or something that'll poke it from the poke the discs from the bottom when the when the bed level goes through. Uh, this thing was pretty easy to mod to get my my sensor to work with. Besides, like adding those piezo discs, all I had to do was uh, take out the original uh, little three pin connectors for those buttons and add mine in right there. Make it easy. They're all tied together using the same exact uh, exact uh, sensor pin. Uh, they're not individual, so I get a couple of hanging one of them at all. The only stick, uh, the only kind of stickler with that is that I had to populate a pull up resistor that was currently unpopulated so that I could power it off the same connector. Um, not necessarily going to be easy enough for, for the average user to do, but I'm sure I could figure out a, a wiring harness that would let me uh, just have an easy drop in for this kind of a printer. Uh, that and I, I did have to go and do the, uh, the solder joint bridge on the bottom of this to bypass the, uh, the uh, voltage regulator because it's 3.3 volt on the 32-bit processors, and this is um, was using a 5 volt regulator, so just the 3.3 volt in from the uh, from this controller works fine on it. And I will now do the demo. So that's working. The thing I did was took the fan out of the thing. Awful and noisy. Okay, so you can see we've got our little blue 
light going on on the bottom of this thing, which means that it's on and it's ready to start signaling. There we are, so I'm just going to put the sucker up for you guys while it runs. Okay. Let's do a D28 first at the top. Mm -hmm. I think it's going so fast that you can't really see the LED turning off. But, oh, there it goes. So I do notice that <clears throat> while I'm doing the probing, sometimes it double taps, sometimes it does one and then just backs out again. Um, not sure why that's that is yet. I think it has something to do with the the, uh, the timing of the script versus the uh, when it's actually tapping. Maybe there's something cycling wise that's that's like lining up and giving a race condition or something like that. But what I have noticed is that even when it has a particular point that um, has the double tap versus the single tap there. It still shows up almost identical between tests. So it's not that much of a difference, I think. Um, let me get that camera up for you guys so you can see a little bit better. seconds. So I'm just going to go and uh, do that again so you can see a little bit better. I realize I don't have, didn't have a very large view on there. Uh, another thing about this printer is that when you do the bed leveling, it just thinks it's still printing. So <laughs> if it cancels the darn thing, then you can actually go through and do whatever. Uh, but if you add your bed leveling uh, to the beginning of your scripts for uh, for your slicer should work just fine. Um, if you need to know that, command, it's G twenty nine P six to get the full bed level. Um, it's uh, something you can you can send over the uh, the API protocols, or you can install the uh, the different web app version. That I, I'll I'll link that later. But it's uh, it, no change in the firmware. They just they, you can upload your own um, your own web. Uh, client or server rather, um, we get this one particular gives you more options. So, get this going again. All right, so let's now do and put up. Okay, so I 
that is about it for the demoing portion and the explanations and such. I'm sure there's things I haven't covered, covered quite yet. Um, I do have the, the Q&As that were sent in ahead of time that I'm going to go over first. Um, uh, DJM, yes, that's correct. So the larger the piezo is, the the, uh, the higher the voltage output, and therefore the, the more sensitive it will be. So you have to take that into account when you're building your, um, your mounts for it. Um, if you have a mount like I built with this thing, it doesn't need a lot of actuation force in order to, to, to make it uh, do its thing. Um, if you have something that has less movement to it, um, or if you're, if you're um, mounting it in, um, in a particular area that might be cramped, um, all you'd need to do is uh, we'd probably change the, uh, the profile to have a higher amplification ratio. So, um, there's a lot of ways to handle this. All right, so uh, question, what's the voltage follower for? Um, that, again, is the lower threshold, no, 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 yeah, lower threshold that the piezo signal starts from when it's coming into the comparator. And because it's attached via a one mega ohm resistor, it's not gonna have a very fast recovery time. It's very slow, in fact, and um, therefore it allows the, the piezo, uh, piezo signal to ramp and then slide back down. Um, to, it's the, why not use an external DAC? Now, um, I started out looking at that. Um, having an external DAC IC is expensive, and it's uh, it's oftentimes, like, it's not like they're huge, but they take up some room. But more often than not, when I was looking at doing externals, uh, they would, um, they were actually more expensive than, than the, the MCU I was using. So it just didn't make a lot of sense to, to include one. Uh, if I was doing something bigger, like if, if I have, um, if I go through in, in the future and end up building like a smart extruder uh, and my onboard MCU doesn't have a DAC, then I probably will end up adding that. But for something like this, where it's a very basic sensor, it's something that's supposed to be a, an easy upgrade, a drop in, I don't want to make it too complex and I don't want to make it too expensive. Um, I'm trying to make it as, as easy and simple and cheap as it possibly can be um, so that it will be it will be widely adopted. Um, let's see. But the uh, um, the new or the, the V2 uh, has the PWM low pass filter to do almost what a DAC does. Uh, the V3 is being switched over to uh, instead of using an AVR chip, I'm going to be switch, switching over to a um, a SAMD uh, SAMD 21E, yeah, um, which has a, has one onboard DAC. So I'll be able to use an on, uh, the onboard DAC for one of the channels, and then the other one I'll probably still use the PWM low pass filter method. Uh, so that's going to be something I'm migrating toward. Uh, the what would be the best approach? To mounting the piezo. Now that is kind of dependent upon what it is you want to do. Uh, if you want to use the FFC version of, of my sensor, then you have to do it on the printhead, or you have to have a separate standalone sensor. Uh, like I was showing you earlier, um, you need to have some way for the piezo disc to be to be flexed as the uh, the extruder touches the bed. So that's that's the main factor you need to take into account. If you can get it to do that, pretty much golden. So this I, I'm, this kind of method that I, that I built, this is one of, one of the ones for the accurate, so it's supposed to sit like this vertically. But this method could be easily used for something like the Flash Forge or the, uh, the MakerBots where it's sitting horizontally. Um, so you can, you can have this on the bottom and just attach your extruder to, to that that way. Um, I'm sure I could figure out a method by which we could um, make the uh, the extruder assembly centrally uh, mounted. There'd be probably a hole through the middle of it, that kind of thing, and we could just put the piezo in a different spot. Uh, but it's uh, most advisable for the, for the standalone. I think so far the, the the best results I've seen are on underbed sensors. So having one set up at each of the the various different um, points where you have your springs, uh, have something sitting next to the spring um, that can push on the piezo, piezo stuck to the bottom, 
with a little bit of give in the middle, so you have. Um, let's see, we've got this disc. And you need to have tape. Look at my, my thermal tape here. Slice a couple of pieces off. Come on. So, what you want to do is you stick it to the outer edge, like so. And then what you have is a little gap where it would sit. And that disc can then be flexed downward toward the bed in that gap. So the, the, uh, the tape acts kind of like a shim, but it also fits it in place. And then you poke in the middle, and there you go, you have a signal. So, um, the, uh, that seems to me like the best way to avoid having any kind of um, looseness or, or uh, play in your extruder assemblies. Um, another method that was that was introduced to me um, by another user um, is something used on, on one of the FL Sun. I think it was a, a, an i3 phone or a 4XY, I'm not sure, but the, they had end stops on either end of the X gantry that would open when the nozzle touched the bed. Which, I mean, that's a great method, uh, but the mechanical end stops have that uncertainty problem with the actuation. So, if we can figure out a way of doing exactly that, where the the, uh, the piece of the matter each each end of the uh, the X gantry and get pushed on or flexed when the uh, the gantry or the other uh, nozzle touches the bed, the gantry moves down, gets some resistance, and off you go. I think that that'd be a good way of doing it without introducing a lot of uh, play. As well, so we'll just have to see. All right. Will the piezo sensor work out of the box with Marlin? Yes, it will. Uh, at the moment, the uh, the only interaction it has with the, the 3D printer controller is as an end stop. So you can hook it up using any of the end stop pins and configure your Marlin or Repetier or whatever firmware you're using to um, to use that end stop input as a Z probe. And it'll work just fine. The uh, the future versions will also work in roughly the same way. The only difference is, is that I'm going to be introducing a way for you to set parameters on the piezo sensor from the 3D printer controller, and I'll be doing that by setting the uh, the controller up as an I2C slave device. So you can send commands from the 3D printer over I2C. It'll take those commands to, and change its parameters and do its tuning that kind of thing. So. Um, that's uh, the last feature I really want to add to this particular project. Um, once I've got that particular thing added and it works and everything is good, then I'm going to be moving off to uh, the building of the, the smart technology extruder because people have gotten uh, a little bit angsty about the word smart extruder these days and what a makeup box they're doing. But anyway, so the um, yeah, next project is going to be that, um, that smart extruder board, which should have okay, uh, as many features as you, as you guys can possibly think of. I'm going to try to stuff them all in there, so we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, but for now, the sensor works out of the box with every firmware there is, as long as it uses an in-stop. And uh, the future stuff, I'm going to have to work with from our uh, designers to, to get that, that, that integration worked out. Uh, let's see. And we do mesh, le uh, med, uh, mesh leveling and bed mapping. Yes, absolutely. Just like any other sensor that's that's designed for, for this kind of probing, this will do the same thing. The only, only stipulation is that you have to have that ability within your firmware. Okay. Uh, the sen is sensor negatively affected by, the ma by a magnetic bed. I don't see that happening. Like the um, the amount of uh, of electric uh, charge that's, that's generated by the piezos um, is pretty much good enough to overcome any kind of magnetic interference, unless you're putting something that's huge and electromagnetic on top of it. Um, but even so, what the uh, the piezo senses is changes. So it doesn't have specifically um, like an, a voltage at a particular spot. What it has is a voltage on change. So you could have it pre-bent a little bit like this, and if you bend it more, it'll do another signal. 
If you put it the other way, what it'll do is it'll do a negative voltage instead of a positive one. So it, it outputs the um, a voltage signal in relation to how it's bent in which direction. So if you have something like um, a thermal situation that you're, you're I'm putting it under a bed, it's going to be hot. I'm putting it next to a magnet. It, it's going to have some uh, some electricity in the air, like the EMF in the, in the air messing with it. But all those things will be at a sort of a stable state. And the change, when you tap it, is still going to be a spike. And that's what the sensor is picking up. Uh, Something else that, that another user asked, I, I answered before, was whether the, uh, um, the sensor would be susceptible to other, other interference, um, like the BL Touch is. So apparently, the BL Touch, which was previously one of the more popular uh, 3D printers, these sensors, um, has a, um, a little serve, um, solenoid almost that moves the pin up and down. Um, and when you're you're about to do your your bed leveling, you go down, it goes and touches the bed, touches the bed. But the actuation of doing that was causing some magnetic interference on the solenoid, which was causing the signals to get a little bit apparently. So it doesn't have the same level of accuracy as their advertising, sadly. So um, that again is not necessarily a problem on, on my my circuit because it's uh, it's static. There's no moving parts apart from like the uh, what is it? I should rephrase that. There are moving parts, but not in the electrical circuit itself. So I'm I'm not using a coil, which we, which would cause some uh, some induction, or uh, it would actually absorb some of the signal, cause it to be delayed. I'm not using anything like that they are, where they've got an analog reading and and then they're putting out a, a signal from NAT tiny from there to the uh, to the three D printer. Um, it's uh, for the most part is going to be um, really stable. And the only thing that needs to get done now is we need to, to build in um, profiles for the um, the size of the, the disc and the mounting scheme that's being used. Uh, I might do some further tweaking on that. Maybe I'll um, I'll figure out the uh, if the, if the Marlin guys can help me out with a, some sort of an auto tuning feature, kind of like what PID auto tuning does. But uh, as long as we get the ITC up and running, it should be pretty much off to the races. Uh, so, UC guy mentioned so uh, there's a, a lot of heat can reduce the, uh, the piezo effect. That's true. Um, I have to do some more testing, but the the whole point of the uh, of the onboard MCU is to, to account for that. So when uh, when the heat increases, um, I don't think that that'd be too much of a problem. I think the um, it's, it'd be hard to, to do any kind of sensing as far as the uh, the change in, in amplitude based on that. I'd have to do some tests to check on that. But um, worst case, you can just increase the, the gain output. So um, that'd be another thing that we'd, we'd want to do for the building of profiles is if you plan on using the, um, an underbed situation and, and you, you can set up a, um, I can set up a parameter that gives the the, uh, the sensor an idea of what temperature it'd be running out and then do some calculations to see exactly how much gain factor is lost by that temperature and add that into the profiler. All right, so that's all the questions I had submitted beforehand. Does anybody have anything else?
I'm not getting anything from you guys at the moment, so I'm just going to sit here for a few more minutes. If you guys think of any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, not even just about the uh, um, this particular circuit. If you have uh, any questions about future stuff or um, want to gab about something, let me know. Uh, if you have, uh, want to see anything, uh, let me know of that as well. Is uh, Taylor's Folgers had had been rebuilding. Uh, he's got this builder he's been working on for uh, which is going to be a little bit of PLC on the electronics. Uh, I've been working on it, popping on for a few months. There we go. So I'm using a server power supply. <laughs> got that mounted up on there. And uh, we got our MOSFETs on the front there, and we got our voltage regulator, uh, an extra voltage regulator on the front for that. Uh, the controller. And I got an actual uh, a piezo disc on the mountain here, but it's using the, the, the original precision piezo one. I haven't had a chance to actually poke that yet, but um, as you can see, I've been working on this for more than uh, than <laughs> working on, or I've had my own sensor to work with, so um, we'll see how that goes. Some of the, one of the coolest things that he's done, I'll show you, is this thing, which is a, a thermoelectric pump cooling system that's going to be attached to his effector through some hoses. So we got three hoses out, and there's three hose inputs on his effector that go to a, a little cooling ring on the bottom that uh, gives a nice little even output. And uh, so hot air comes out the bottom part. Start trying to get the off of there. Well, that's not happening. I kind of put them together pretty firmly. Uh, but either way, I've got a, um, the hot output on the bottom here is getting redirected backwards and out of the uh, the 3D printer. Cold air come out of the top of this will get rerouted down to the uh, the effector for the cooling parts. And we're just going to use some like, silicon hoses for that. Well, I haven't gotten any questions from you guys, so um, I think I'm going to call that a, uh, an end to it. Uh, if you guys want to uh, see another one of these, or if you have any other questions, you want to see me do other stuff, let me know. I'll see you guys later. Thanks.